ओके गुड मॉर्निंग प्रणीत गुड मॉर्निंग मैडम गुड मॉर्निंग गुड मॉर्निंग अर्चना गुड मॉर्निंग ईशा गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीवन गुड मॉर्निंग मैम गुड मॉर्निंग विल स्टार्ट विद द न्यू क्लास टुडेस टॉपिक इज सुपीरियर बिना केवल ऑब्स्ट्रक्शन एंड बिकॉज़ ऑफ अनअवॉर्डेबल सरकमस्टेंसेस प्रणीत रेजिडेंट इज नॉट एबल टू टेक द क्लास सो डॉक्टर प्रणीत डिसाइडेड दैट ही विल टेक द क्लास thank you pranit thank you madam pranit uh, most of the people they are knowing but uh, pranit is uh, basically he did his md and dm from aims new delhi and now he is working as a consultant department of onco anesthesia and palliative medicine at endo american cancer hospital research institute hyderabad they are the first one uh, they are the i think few amongst those those who have started dnb palliative medicine program in corporate hospital and they are doing very well i recently met with dr senthil in manipal pranit okay. and he said that our palliative medicine department is doing fantastic i was so happy to hear this i was so happy thank so you, thank you pranit and uh, your colleagues so you are do definitely nobody will say like this in if we are not doing fantastic so i am really happy to hear this so um he has got several national and international publication and he has got his area of interest are to relieve refractory pain uh to have, take care of the patient at the end of life so end of life care and malignant ascites so pranit please go ahead and uh, hmm, pranit was most one of among our most sincere students from aims new delhi and he is doing equally Uh, or better work at hyderabad thank you pranit go ahead thank you madam yeah uh, is my screen visible now yes we can yes, see yes it is visible just a minute so uh, good morning everyone the today's topic will be uh, on superior vena cava obstruction um and uh, i'll be talking about uh, covering these topics uh, in brief about the introduction etiopathogenesis uh, assessment uh, coming to the history examination management what are the, what are the future scopes of research and review of literature so i'll be uh, giving you few case scenarios and uh, we will be discussing about the management of these case scenarios at the end of the presentation so this is for uh, stimulation of uh, brain cells uh we have a patient who is a, a 62 year old farmer and presented to opd with complaints of shortness of breath dry cough unable to lie down in supine position he rumor saturations were 94 percentage on examination there were prominent veins over the anterior chest wall and abdominal wall these are the prominent veins over the anterior chest wall and abdominal wall coming to the second case she is a 65 year old female known case of ca right lung admitted in the palliative ward with complaints of severe dyspnea her right arm is swollen with non pitting edema facial puffiness frown and fatigue look on her face and clinically she is appearing dyspneic her saturations on room air were 92% so this is a ct scan of the uh, patient mentioned in the case number 2 we have an other patient who is a 18 year old girl who presented to the casualty with acute respiratory distress facial puffiness was evident along with uh, dilated veins over the anterior chest wall a rumor saturations for 74 percentage and uh, these are the dilated uh, veins over the anterior chest wall so before we uh, start with the uh, presentation i would like you to like to brush up on the uh, few important uh, aspects as per the anatomy of the uh, venous drainage concern so on either side on the right side and left side the internal jugular vein and the subclavian vein join to form the brachiocephalic veins both of the brachiocephalic veins they combine to form the superior vena cava superior vena cava as we all know it, it empties into the right atrium before it enters in, uh, empties into the right atrium the azygous veins uh, they come and join the superior vena cava uh, uh, before it empties into the right atrium on the so uh, whenever there is a tumor which is causing the obstruction of the superior vena cava 
uh, it will be causing the dilatation of the superior vena cava, but the collaterals which are formed uh, will be will be varied based on the presentation or based on the level of obstruction of the tumor. So, superior vena cava syndrome is uh, superior vena cava obstruction is often a complication of cancer, as we can see that malignancy is eighty percentages and uh, thrombotic causes are only twenty percentages. Its presentation is a uh, uh, its presentation can be subtle and most secondary, most cases are secondary to the malignancy that may or may not be diagnosed yet. Superior vena cava syndrome is a group of symptoms uh, which, is, uh, uh, which is caused by obstruction of the superior vena cava, a short white vessel carrying circulated blood into the heart and it accounts for 35% of total venous return. Superior vena cava syndrome is superior vena cava obstruction plus tracheal compression. Uh, I have discussed that superior vena cava is a thin-walled vessel and it is extremely susceptible to compression. The majority of the cases are caused by the malignant tumors within the mediastinum. These are most commonly lung cancer and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which are directly compressing or invading the superior vena cava wall. Severity of the symptoms, they depend on the rapidity of onset of obstruction and its location. Symptoms are mild as obstruction is slow and progressive as collaterals develop. Excuse me, I'm not able to change the slides. Uh, just click anywhere on the screen and then you can change. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So an estimated 15,000 cases of superior vena cava syndrome occur in every year in the United States with uh, studies pointing to increasing frequency due to the concomitant rise of use of semi-permeant in intravascular catheters. These catheters are causing thrombosis and in turn causing the rise of the uh, uh, obstruction within the superior vena cava. One of the studies demonstrated the mean survival in the favorable in a favorable good response superior vena cava obstruction in small cell lung cancer patients, and it was nine point five months and two years survival is uh, ten percentages. So when should we suspect superior vena cava obstruction? When you see a patient, when do you think that they, this patient might be having superior vena cava obstruction? When we notice there is a dilatation of the two external jugular veins or when the patient is having increasing symptoms, when the patient, uh, when the patient is lying in a supine position or having a uh, uh, cough along with these symptoms. So coming to the etiology of the uh, superior vena cava obstruction, uh, the commonest causes are malignant causes and uh, among them, non-small cell lung cancer, small cell lung cancer, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, mediastinal and metastatic disease, thymoma and other thymic neoplasms, mesothelioma are the most common. Among the non-malignant causes, it, mostly it is due to the catheter-related uh, complications that is mostly hydrogenic, catheter, port or cardiac device associated thrombosis, superior vena cava obstruction associated with upper extremity hemodialysis access. It could be also uh, increased, increased uh, tendency to cause uh, more thrombus due to thrombophilia or infection related to mediastinal granuloma, fibrosing mediastinitis, etc. The rarest uh, malignant causes like germ cell tumors, esophageal carcinoma, thyroid malignancy also can cause uh, superior vena cava obstruction. Whereas uh, among non-malignant causes, aortic aneurysm uh, is a very rare cause causing superior vena cava obstruction. So today, the majority of the superior vena cava syndromes are the result of mediastinal malignancy. Most common is uh, small cell bronchogenic carcinoma, second is non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, third are metastatic tumors. Hydrogenic thrombus formation or superior vena cava stenosis is a growing etiology due to pacemaker-wise semi-permanent intravascular catheters used for hemodialysis or long-term antibiotics or chemotherapy. Uh, discussing the pathophysiology of what is causing superior vena cava obstruction, the mechanisms could be uh, due to com compromised vessel anatomy. It's a combination of compromised vessel anatomy, impaired venous flow, and diminished vessel wall integrity. These mechanisms often coexist in patients presenting with superior vena cava syndrome. So, as I mentioned that the uh, presentation of symptoms vary depending on the level of obstruction of the tumor uh, and on which level it is causing the superior vena cava obstruction. Extrinsic compression and obstruction of superior vena cava by a mass in the mediastinum uh, or occlusive venous thrombus formation that compromises venous flow back to the heart. So, uh, this is the reason. Uh, this is the reason superior vena cava obstruction develops and there will be a resultant venous wall inflammation, fibrosis, and eventually thrombosis leading to the stenosis of the vessel wall itself. 
So uh, the collaterals develop uh, as a result of obstruction. These collaterals divert the blood to the lower body and blood is carried via the inferior vena cava, azagous vein and the intercostals and they reaches the heart. And uh, 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 in this process, there are collaterals and dilated veins. The clinical findings in the superior vena cava syndrome are closely linked to the venous congestion and the resultant elevation of the venous pressure seen in the upper body. So whenever it, uh, patients are uh, suspected of superior vena cava obstruction, what could be the common presentations? What could be the physical signs? There could be facial edema or plethora of the upper extremities, uh, conjectival peri periorbital edema, dilated neck veins which are not pulsatile, dilated collateral veins over the arms and anterior chest wall, edema of the hands and arms, strider, cyanosis, increased respiratory rate, papillary edema in the late stage, and uh, a pemberton sign, which I will elaborate in the later slides. The symptoms tend to be worse in the first thing in the morning and can be exacerbated by maneuvers which increase the venous pressure, like bending forwards, coughing, sneezing, and straining. So whenever a patient presents with these particular signs and symptoms, uh, we should be having a clinical suspicion of superior vena cava obstruction. So the symptoms, uh, uh, signs we have discussed, what could be the symptoms? Symptoms could be those of uh, increased venous pressures and uh, the earlier symptoms like breathlessness, ruddy complexion, uh, that is uh, the redness, and uh, dysphagia, chest pain, and uh, cough. Whenever these are seen along with the, in, along alone or in combination, we should be having suspicion of superior obstruction. The late symptoms like headache, which is worse on stooping, visual changes, severe respiratory distress, dizziness, venous distension in the neck and distended veins in the upper chest and arm, facial swelling after bending or laying down, upper limb edema, lightheadedness, or edema of the neck, which is also called collar of strokes. So, <clears throat> The, this is a slide which is showing the percentages of the signs and symptoms associated with superior vena cava obstruction. Uh, the signs like uh, facial edema, arm edema, distended neck veins, distended chest veins, facial plethora, and visual symptoms are the uh, signs which are seen uh, from uh, increasing to decreasing order, that is in the descending order. Whereas the respiratory, uh, respiratory symptoms like dyspnea, cough, hoarsenessness are the uh, symptoms which are seen uh, from most common to least common. So this is a slide which is showing the anatomy of the azagous system. The azagous uh, system is also important because depending on the uh, obstruction, whether the obstruction is above the level of uh, drainage of azagous vein into the superior vena cava or below the level of azagous vein draining into the superior vena cava, uh, the dilated veins and uh, the symptoms are, uh, are symptoms appear. This is the uh, this is important because. For the PGs also, uh, uh, a multiple choice question can be asked depending on the uh, depending on this point that a patient is having uh, uh, swelling and distended veins over the uh, chest and uh, where do you think the level of obstruction could be? So now coming to this slide, the accessory hemiazagous veins drains the upper uh, uh, upper. Uh, vasculature on the left side and uh, hemiazagous veins drains the lower part on the left side. So both of them, they empty into the azagous vein on the right side. The azagous vein empties into the superior vena cava just above, uh, just uh, before it uh, in, empties itself into the right atrium. So whenever the obstruction is proximal to the entrance of SVC, that is uh, after the azagous vein has emptied into the uh, uh, superior vena cava, whenever the obstruction is below the level of azagous vein, there can be dilatation of the anterior abdominal wall veins or chest wall veins because uh, the collateral vessels uh, uh, which have to, uh, the collaterals that develop uh, here over the anterior chest wall. Whereas if the level of obstruction is uh, before, the, uh, before the azagous vein empties into the superior vena cava, the chance that collaterals develop over the anterior chest wall are uh, very less and the patients uh, typically presents with plethora of symptoms like uh, distended arm and neck veins, edema of ne face, and face, neck and arms. So the upper part of uh, the body is more edematous here and uh, uh, because the level of a tumor is above the level of drainage of the azagous vein into the superior vena cava. 
So this is the Pemberton sign, which is which should be always be performed with uh, caution in hospital setup only because it uh, it can cause a uh, tendency to uh, cause immediate uh, arrest. So it is a physical examination tool used to demonstrate the presence of latent pressure in the thoracic inlet. The maneuver is achieved by having the patient elevate both arms, usually 180 degrees anterior flexion at the shoulder until the forearm touches the sides of the face. A positive Pemberton sign is marked by presence of facial congestion, cyanosis, as well as respiratory distress after approximately one minute. So this is highly indicative of superior vena cava obstruction because we are compromising the uh, circulation by elevate uh, by increasing the mediastinal pressures. So for uh, already co compromised uh, uh, venous drainage, like in superior vena cava obstruction, can they can have uh, immediate uh, uh, respiratory distress um, within a minute of performing this manual. So having uh, the patient raise both arms overhead will immediately exacerbate the symptoms as I discussed. And uh, uh, symptoms of SVC syndrome as blood from the engorged upper extremities drain down towards the face and head, but it is unable to return to the right atrium because of the increased uh, mediastinal and the thoracic pressure. This pathognomic sign is known as Pemberton sign. So you at all uh, have described a, a grading system, a clinical grading system for superior vena cava obstruction. There is another grading system called Kishi, which, which I'll be talking about later. So you at all in the Journal of Thoracic Oncology in 2008 have described this uh, grading system. And uh, grade zero is asymptomatic, uh, asymptomatic superior vena cava obstruction. The incidence is less as 10%. Uh, so here there is a radiographic evidence of superior vena cava obstruction in the absence of symptoms. So there will be no symptoms, but only the radiographic evidence is uh, suggesting that there is a chance of superior vena cava obstruction. Whereas grade one, this, uh, it is called mild category and it is 25 percentage in incidence. So uh, there is an edema in the head and neck with uh, vascular distension. There can be a plethora or cyanosis, uh, but the symptoms are not uh, very prominent over here. In the moderate category, there is edema in head and neck with functional impairment like dysphagia, cough, impairment of the head, jaw, eyelid movements, disturbance in the visual field due to ocular edema. In the severe category, uh, there is there could be mild to moderate cerebral edema or mild to moderate laryngeal edema or, uh, and diminished cardiac reserve, that is syncope after bending. So these patients uh, require immediate uh, hospitalization or immediate management. Uh, as per the need. The life-threatening uh, category, there is significant cerebral edema there. That is the patient is confusion, uh, conf a patient is having confusion or obtendation, with, which is a reduction in the mental status. Significant laryngeal edema with strider or significant hemodynamic compromise causing uh, hypotension or synco. So uh, severe and life-threatening categories are uh, an indication for uh, immediate hospital admission. In the uh, fatal category, the death is uh, uh, almost evident. So whenever we uh, see a patient with sh uh, shortness of breath and dilated neck veins, what are our differentials which we should consider? So the patient could either be having congestive heart failure, right ventricular infarct, superior vena cava obstruction, cardiac tamponade, constrictive pericarditis, tension pneumothorax, massive hemothorax, massive pulmonary embolism, etc. So uh, whenever the patient presents with facial swelling alone, we should be thinking in the lines of nephrotic syndrome, cellulitis, mixed edema, superior vena cava obstruction, chronic steroids causing moon face, melkerson rosenthal syndrome, or, which is orofacial edema or angioedema. So coming to the assessment of a patient, assessment and monitoring of the patient with superior vena cava obstruction, diagnosis of superior vena cava syndrome is made largely based on the patient's history and physical findings, which often develop over a period of days to weeks. So we need to obtain full history, including the details of the known malignancies and their treatment, development of new or worsening respiratory symptoms, arm swelling and headaches, and rapidity of onset, the comorbidities the patient is having, medications, including the use of, uh, use of, uh, use of steroids and contraindications to steroids and anticoagulation, and uh, examination, we need to look for the distended external and internal jugular veins, collateral veins over the anterior chest wall, facial and arm, facial arm and neck swelling, and conjectural redness. So this is the basic assessment and uh, examination. So the aims of management should be a recognition of life-threatening symptoms, which is airway compromised or cerebral edema, which I have said that uh, 
diminished uh, obtentation, etc. So these need to be uh, uh, these need to be evaluated first that whether his patient is having significant significant respiratory distress or significant uh, uh, symptoms which are, which are compromising the mentation status, and uh, if necessary, admission has to be uh, advised. Confirmation of the venous obstruction, which could be by the imaging, imaging plus or minus interventions to establish the etiology, interventions like biopsy, etc. And uh, in interventions also can be performed by uh, stenting of the uh, venous system to relieve the obstruction or interventions like radi radiation therapy can also be advised. And uh, after that, we can also, uh, along with it also, we can uh, go for the treatment of the underlying cause. So in the emergency department, when the patient comes with uh, features suggestive of superior vena cava obstruction, uh, when we are not yet uh, clear of the diagnosis, the simple measures which we need to follow in the emergency department are like uh, nursing the patient in the proper position, correcting hypoxemia, and if necessary, oxygen uh, has to be administered, elevating the patient's head end. Uh, by doing this, the hydrostatic pressure in the uh, uh, head is reduced and uh, edema can be uh, controlled. Uh, these patients, we need to consider that they are having a potentially difficult airway because they cannot lie flat. They have an edematous epiglottis and vocal cords with a narrow glottic opening. And the mediastinal tumor, whenever it is there and uh, whenever the uh, tumor can cause compression over the trachea or the bronchus and uh, it can uh, cause difficulty in ventilation. And there is also a superior mediastinal syndrome, which I mentioned, that is superior vena cava obstruction plus tracheal compression. So there is a, a small thing that uh, we need to uh, consider about uh, securing IV access in these patients who are uh, having uh, suspected of superior vena cava obstruction. So it should be considered in lower, lower limbs in cases of complete superior vena cava obstruction. Whenever there is a CT evidence which shows that there is a complete superior vena cava obstruction, we need to consider access in the lower limbs. Uh, with partial obstruction, upper limb access is acceptable whenever there is uh, when there whenever there is securing uh, difficulty in the uh, uh, securing IV access is difficult in the lower limbs. Upper limb IV access whenever it is secured, then you can expect uh, some delay in the resuscitation fluids and drugs to reach the central circulation, and uh, there is also a risk of overdose. In the absence of major bleeding or hypotension, fluid restriction we have to be very careful about. Diuretics must be used judicially to avoid hypovolemia. I will uh, explain about this in the later slide. It because uh, <clears throat> one one needs to be critically uh, one needs to be aware that though literature uh, some literature suggests diuretics as therapeutic options for the facial and upper extremity edema of superior vena cava syndrome, diuresis what can it do? It is it is actually reducing the circulating volume and uh, central venous return significantly. So uh, the pre cardiac preload is reduced and. Uh, uh, but one needs to be aware that what we are reducing here is uh, not the fluid overload. The problem is not the fluid overload, but a trapped pool of venous blood and interstitial fluid. So we are already the cardiac output is reduced and we are compromising the cardiac preload even further. So there is a chance that we may precipitate cardiac arrest. Uh, so we, we need to be careful when we give diuretics and uh, extreme uh, monitoring is uh, a close monitoring is, extra, is required. So the role of steroids, steroids, uh, there are only case studies and uh, uh, the main mechanism that uh, steroids, uh, how they are acting is because they are reducing the tumor and airway edema. So as I mentioned that only case studies are only available and steroids are usually used in conjunction with the radiotherapy because of concern about radiation induced edema. Steroids, they reduce the tumor burden in lymphoma and thymoma and they are reducing the obstruction. Unless there are severe symptoms, we should not give high dose of corticosteroids until biopsy is taken because they may end under the histological diagnosis. Also, steroids can cause uh, steroid-induced tumor lysis syndrome in certain uh, lymphomas. So, uh, imaging modalities of the superior vena cava uh, suspected patient. So, we need to identify the site and the extent of occlusion. The presence of intravascular thrombus and collateral circulations have to be identified and the presence of collateral vessels whenever it is seen clinically, it is highly suggestive of superior vena cava obstruction. So as I mentioned, we need to identify the underlying cause and planning treatment according to the cause. So information on the length of the lesion is to be noted in the imaging and any involvement of the brachiocephalic veins have to be noted. 
So also there can be some signs whenever there is no, uh, when we work in a particular peripheral center and there is no CT, uh, CT or venogram, which is not immediately available. We can also uh, have, uh, we can also get some information from the chest X-ray. If there is an opacity above the right stem bronchus and there is a dilatation of the arch of azagus along with the clinical symptoms, you know, there can be suspicion uh, for uh, supravedicate obstruction. When there is a subiotic op uh, opacity or aortic nipple sign, which is dilatation of the sup left superior intercostal vein, uh, it indicates that uh, uh, there can be a suspicion for uh, supravenicular obstruction. Aortic nipple, uh, which is seen here with the pointer, is seen on about 10% of the PHS X rays on the lateral surface of the aortic arch or aortic knob. It represents the left superior intercostal vein, and when it is prominent, superior vena obstruction should be considered as the left superior intercostal vein serves as a collateral pathway. So, uh, in the chest X ray, also we, we can see sometimes a neck mass, which is substernal goiter, uh, superior mediastinal widening, pleural or pericardial effusion, or mediastinal widening. I uh, mentioned that there is a right, uh, right hilar mass can be uh, uh, often due to bronchogenic carcinoma. Uh, and uh, anterior mediastinal mass, which can be uh, noted with the mediastinal widening and uh, could be suggestive of lymphomas. So this is a normal uh, CT of the uh, normal CT in a, on the left side. So we can see that there is a superior vena cava with good uh, lumen, uh, luminal uh, caliber. The iota, uh, arch of iota basically ascending and descending iota have been marked here. And this is the trachea, which is uh, having a, a good luminal capacity, along with esophagus, which is which has a narrow lumen relatively. And uh, uh, so uh, these are the mediastinal structures in the normal, C, normal CT of the mediastinum. Whereas whenever uh, there is a tumor which can be uh, which is, which is near the proximity of the superior vena cava, the luminal uh, capacity of the superior vena cava could be narrowed. And the mediastinal anatomy is distorted over here. There, we can also see that there is a uh, compression over the trachea, and uh, the trachea and the underlying bronchus is also uh, slightly compressed. So this is a coronal CT, and uh, in, in this we can see uh, the brachiocephalic veins uh, uh, forming the superior vena cava, and the tumor which can compress over the superior vena cava can cause the dilatation of the superior vena cava. So this is a 3D CT appearance of multiple collaterals of the chest wall. So CT venogram is usually considered the gold standard uh, and it should be carried out prior to the stenting to delineate the presence of an SVC stenosis or occlusion to identify the extent of obstruction. Uh, as I mentioned that uh, this is the second uh, uh, clinical grading score called Kishi scoring, uh, Kishi scoring and it is used to uh, quantify the clinical gravity of superior vena cava syndrome. So basically, it is a guide for someone when uh, when they have to go for an invasive procedure and interventional procedure like superior vena cava uh, or vessel wall stenting. So a score which is exceeding four is an indication uh, for uh, placement of a uh, stent by percutaneous route. So the uh, uh, the scoring is uh, given in four categories: in neurological signs. Thoracic pharyngeal laryngeal signs, facial signs, and vessel dilatation. In the neurological signs, uh, if the awareness disorders or coma is present, score is score of four is given. Visual disorders, headache, vertigo, memory disorders are there. Then a score of three. Mental disorders, score of two. Malaise, a score of one. Thoracic or pharyngeal laryngeal signs, orthopnea, laryngeal edema, score of three. Strider, dysphagia, dyspnea, score of two. Coughing, pleurisy, score of one. And facial signs, lip edema, nasal obstruction, score of two. Facial edema, score of one. And vessel dilatation, neck, face and arm, score of one. So what are the advantages of superior vena cava uh, stenting? The advantages are rapid relief of symptoms of venous congestion, which usually within a day to 72 hours following the procedure. Allowing treatment of underlying pathology to be initiated and uh, prevents risk of death due to laryngeal or bronchial edema that we can buy more time. Uh, indications like uh, uh, indications to perform stenting are symptomatic malignant superior vena cava obstruction, symptomatic benign superior vena cava obstruction, known CT or RT resistant tumors, or when the Kishi score is more than four, as I mentioned in the previous slide. Relative contraindications for stenting are patient when they are not able to lie flat or semi supine on the table, patient with malignancy with a very good chance of cure or remission. Then we can consider we can delay the stenting. 
So there are also complications with stent, stenting, like there could be stent migration, bleeding, infection, thrombosis, supervena cava rupture, pericardial tamponade, hematoma at the site of insertion, acute tumor lysis syndrome, etc. The late complications could be bleeding, uh, bleeding on death. Coming to the further management of the supravenical obstruction, in the need of an urgent, intervene, uh, uh, urgent intervention, the management should focus initially on establishing the correct diagnosis. The treatment is directed at the underlying pathological process, like in all cases. When the malignancy is suspected without known primary cancer, we need to go for a biopsy, sputum cytology, pleural fluid analysis, excisional lymph node biopsy, bone marrow, bronchoscopy with transbronchial needle aspiration, depending on case-to-case -case basis. So, uh, urgent treatments with corticosteroids and radiotherapy should be used only for life-threatening situations. Like even without the, whenever the biopsy report is also not available, and uh, we need to uh, do something immediately. And uh, radiation, when should it be considered? Whenever the patient is having life-threatening situations like strider, hypotension, collapse, etc. Stenting is becoming increasingly used procedure to patients with severe symptoms such as respiratory distress that require urgent intervention. No evidence to support routine anticoagulation in patients with malignant superavirica obstruction in the absence of thrombosis. So after a tissue diagnosis has been obtained and uh, extent of disease has, to, has been determined, decision has to be made to address control of the malignant process in either a curative fashion or palliatively based on the patient's performance status. Radiation therapy or chemotherapy or stent placement or the combination of these modalities can be tried for management. The certain tumors like non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, small cell lung cancers, germ cell tumors are widely regarded as chemotherapy sensitive tumors. So these tumors, uh, whenever they are present, we can uh, we, uh, when when we have a uh, evidence of tissue diagnosis, uh, starting with chemotherapy seems to be a sensitive option. These patients have good prognosis as there is high risk, high rates of response and quick onset of tumor shrinkage in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and small cell lung cancer. The less responsive uh, tumors like non-sponsor lung cancer, B-cell uh, lymphoma, we need to consider alternate options. And uh, coming to the radiotherapy, majority of the tumors are uh, sensitive to radiotherapy and inf involvement is uh, the improvement of uh, symptoms are usually seen within three days. Whereas with stenting, the improvement is seen within one day only. Radiotherapy is given, to a, given at a dose at, of 20 grays in 5 fractions or 30 grays in 10 fractions. The relative contraindications uh, to radiotherapy could be previous treatment with radiation in the same region, certain connective tissue disorders like scleroderma or known radio-resistant tumors like sarcomas. So <clears throat> com coming to the surgical management of uh, patients with supravenica obstruction, thymomas are, is a relatively resistant to chemotherapy and radiation and surgery is usually advised. And uh, bypass grafting using an autologous vein graft or a synthetic tube can be uh, done. The patency rates of these grafts are usually good and it is up to 80 to 90 percentages. Major surgical procedures that require care, uh, uh, careful patient selections because the dissection of the superior vena cava uh, uh, and uh, placement of graft is a major surgical dissection. It involves open therapotomy, sometimes going on the bypass machine. And it is uh, very difficult for the patient to uh, rehabilitate in the post-operative period. So one needs to be very careful uh, uh, in judging a patient who requires this grafting. Mostly in an oncological setup, it is very difficult because patients, they present in a very late stage. And they uh, these people going for a vessel grafting are very, very rare. So also this procedure has a high morbidity and mortality rate. Coming to the benign superior vena cava obstruction, uh, in the management. Benign causes are more insidious and development of uh, there will be development of uh, adequate collaterals. So treatment is usually directed at the underlying cause. Medical management with steroids uh, and diuretics are usually not useful because it is the thrombus which is causing the symptoms. And uh, usually if the thrombus is uh, confirmed, thrombolysis followed by anticoagulation with warfarin or heparin can be considered. And it is uh, less effective in chronic thrombosis with symptoms, uh, onset of symptoms more than 10 days. Even this thrombolysis uh, can also be not very effective. Whereas if the symptoms are developing rapidly and the patient is having good uh, functional status, one can consider for supravenicava bypass surgery or endovascular stenting. So 
on the three basic methods of uh, 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 treatment uh, management which uh, like radiation stenting chemotherapy i have discussed these are the uh, this is a slide which is showing the comparison of the advantages of disadvantages disadvantages of the various treatment modalities so uh, radiation uh, as a, as we have mentioned that it is a non invasive inter intervention it can also treat the underlying malignancy the disadvantages are the symptom relief usually takes uh, 3 to 15 days and it may compromise a tissue diagnosis if, if it is already not obtained. And uh, initially, the patient's symptoms may get worse and due to inflammation, uh, inflammation and uh, acute response, uh, post-radiation flare-up, there will be aggravation of the symptoms. Coming to the stenting, the advantages are it, uh, relief of symptoms are usually early within 24 to 72 hours and uh, it doesn't compromise the tissue diagnosis and it allows for option of the treatment with chemotherapy, radiation, or combined modality treatment. The disadvantages of stenting are it is an invasive intervention. Complications of uh, bleeding are there. Increased risk of thrombosis due to the foreign object, and it doesn't treat the underlying malignancy. And chemotherapy, uh, it is a non-invasive intervention, so it treat it also treats underlying malignancy. It does not uh, require specialized equipment, and it can also be given in an ICU setup. The disadvantages of chemotherapy are symptom relief usually takes some time and compromise tissue diagnosis if it is not already obtained. Sometimes patients are too sick to tolerate chemotherapy and uh, uh, there could be other complications of chemotherapy like uh, bone marrow suppression, etc. So this is the most common causes, uh, most, most common benign cause for superior venical obstruction is either hydrogenic or thrombotic complications. These are the results from interlink vascular hardware also can be due to uh, the anti uh, um, so we need to consider anticoagulation percutaneous transdermal angioplasty plus or minus metallic strain uh, in these patients superior obstruction may also coexist with pulmonary embolism so the serious sequelae like cerebral edema causing confusions headache possibly coma can be there Cardiac output may be diminished transiently by acute superior vena cava obstruction however within few hours the increased venous pressure forces blood through the collaterals so that a steady state of blood return is once again achieved. Evidence of hemodynamic compromise is usually as a result of mass effect on the heart rather than the superior vena cava compression. So when we see a patient, we will always, uh, what are the questions that should, uh, that should influence our treatment decision? Whether the patient should go for a stenting or chemotherapy or radiotherapy, how do you decide? So we, we need to consider whether the patient is having any relative contraindication for radiotherapy or whether the patient has received any previous chest or mediastinal radiotherapy or is the patient able to lie, uh, lie reasonably flat. So also we need to consider the patient's performance status. We all know about the ECOG PS and we can uh, rate 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 according to it. So and if there is a uh, standing procedure available in our institute, uh, and uh, usually it is performed by the inter interventional radiology and we need to see whether the patient can go for stenting if required. Glucocorticoids, uh, these are uh, one of the uh, key mechanisms, uh, key management uh, line and usually used in conjunction with radiotherapy. As I mentioned that it reduces the tumor and airway edema, it decreases the inflammation by suppressing the migration of polymorphonuclear leukocytes and reversing the increased capillary permeability. Thus, the inflammation is reduced. The doses, which uh, usually can be started as 16 mg, 16 mg OD or 8 mg BD, followed by gradual tapering. Methylprednisolone also can be considered. The adult loading dose is uh, 125 to 2, 250 mg and maintenance dose is 0.5 to 1 mg per kg per dose, QID for up to 5 days. Uh, diuretics, uh, I have mentioned that these decrease the venous return to the heart by decreasing the preload, relieving the increased pressure to the superior vena cava. Uh, Usual uh, uh, drug which we use in uh, most of the setups is uh, furosemide and the dose should be individualized, individualized to the patient depending on the response and uh, we need to go with a lower dose and go upper uh, based on the effect. So uh, increments of 20 to 40 mg no sooner than 6 to 8 hours after the previous dose can be tried until the desired diuresis is occurring. When treating infants, treat with a titrate with a dose of uh, 1 milligram per kg per dose increments until a satisfactory effect is achieved. Adult dose uh, usually administer 20 to 80 mg PO once and then repeat in 6 to 8 hours uh, prorenatal. Alternatively, we can increase the dose by 20 to 40 mg and do not give no sooner than 6 to 8 hours after the previous dose. So the complications uh, 
there could be superior mediastinal syndrome, which is superior vena cava obstruction plus tracheal compression. Rubin syndrome is superior vena cava obstruction plus spinal cord compression. And uh, steroid induced acute tumor lysis syndrome, increased intracranial pressure, spontaneous intracranial hemorrhage can happen. And when we are uh, uh, treating the patient with uh, intervention like uh, stenting, there could be overload syndrome, that is opening of the superior vena cava stenosis, inducing a fast cardiac return of the third compartment uh, fluid and may generate an overload syndrome with pre-capillary pulmonary hypertension and pulmonary edema. So, evidence regarding home care management of superior vena cava obstruction is very, very meager and uh, almost uh, lacking. So, the general measures including uh, oxygen uh, if the patient is hypoxic and uh, dexamethasone uh, 16 mg daily followed by gradual tapering and uh, diuretics should be used with caution. We need to manage uh, associated symptoms like uh, shortness of breath, pain, etc. Avoid exertion techniques and uh, basically concentrate on energy conservation techniques and activity pacing. So, prognosis of the patients who are having supravenical obstruction, the median survival is generally six months. However, this varies widely depending on the etiology or the type of tumor. Prognosis appears to be determined by the underlying malignancy with the overall survival being equal of the patients of the same tumor type and stage with or without the superior vena cava obstruction. That is, depending whether the patient is having superior vena, cava, superior vena cava obstruction or not, the prognosis is almost similar to the underlying tumor pathology with the uh, tumor stage and type. So, uh, coming to the review of literature, a few articles which uh, 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 I'll be discussing. So, this is an <clears throat> article which is published in the Journal of Thrombosis and Thrombolysis in 2019. And uh, it speaks about thrombosis anticoagulation and outcomes in the malignant superior vena cava syndrome. And they say that anticoagulation is often used in superior vena cava syndromes associated with cancer even without thrombosis, but, it, but its effect on outcomes has not been reported. Neither thrombosis nor anticoagulation has affected survival. Anticoagulation is uh, commonly used as a primary prevention, but its benefit remains to be proven. The role of reduced dose anticoagulation in non thrombotic malignant SVC should be prospectively assessed. So, uh, this is an article which is published uh, in 2018. It speaks about uh, pediatric superior vena cava syndrome and evidence based uh, systematic review of literature. What they say is the most common uh, tumors which are causing superior vena cava obstructions are solid tumors in children. Lymphomas uh, are also having the similar uh, rate of presentation, whereas leukemia having uh, a little lesser, uh, a little less rate of presentation. So these are the uh, this is a slide which shows uh, the uh, prevalence of symptoms. So head and neck edema is usually most common and being eighty two percentage distended neck and uh, thoracic wings uh, next common. 54 percentage and color change of the face, neck and upper limbs is uh, followed by, uh, is the next most common, about 24 percentage of uh, patients. So, the common uh, respiratory symptoms in children due to the obstruction are cough, followed by oropharyngeal obstruction, followed by orthopnea. Uh, and uh, the common uh, neurological symptoms, uh, like there could be abtendation and uh, uh, delayed orientation. There are also complications like uh, pleural effusion, chylothorax, airway compression, pericardial effusion in the descending order. So, this is a slide which shows the palliative effectiveness of uh, radiotherapy in the treatment of superior vena cava syndrome. What they are considering here is a palliation index. What does palliation index mean? It is the ratio of the symptom free period on the total survival, which is one in ideal circumstances. And what they have found is the uh, palliation index. Uh, with radiation therapy treatment is 0.55 in non-small cell lung cancer and 0.9 in small cell lung cancer. That means that small cell lung cancer is having a better chance, uh, better shot at radiotherapy uh, for relief of symptoms. So, this is a review article and uh, uh, review of the resection of superior vena cover uh, and management uh, uh, in the benign uh, uh, superior vena cover obstruction and uh, treatment of it by surgical resection and vessel grafting. So what they say that uh, resection and reconstruction can be safely performed in selected patients for benign and malignant obstruction or infiltration of the superior vena cava. So survival and intermediate term patency after tubular grafting of superior vena cava are acceptable. So <clears throat> the evidence which is lacking is how uh, uh, we don't, don't have any prospective studies about the effectiveness of anticoagulants in the patients who are having superior vena cava obstruction. 
and uh, continued use of diuretics and anticoagulants is, is still uh, uh, not very uh, widely reported and their benefits, their uh, side effects are not uh, widely reported yet. Also, uh, what, what uh, benefit is, uh, how much benefit is oxygen support causing in these patients? This is also an uh, area where uh, evidence is lacking. So the case discussions which I mentioned earlier, I'll be coming back to them. So this is a patient who is uh, who I mentioned, the 62-year-old uh, farmer who presented with OPD with shortness of breath. He's uh, 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 having shortness of breath, but that is not very severe. He's having dry cough, unable to lie down in a supine position. So his saturations on room air are 94%. So the collaterals are there over anterior abdominal wall, and uh, it, has very, it is more prominent. And it indicates that the level of obstruction is below the uh, uh, below the azagous vein, which is entering into the uh, superior vena cava. Patient is clinically not very dyslexic, so we can consider for steroids, chemo radiation, or stent placement in this. So this uh, second patient, you see, she is 65 year old uh, female, and uh, she has uh, she is having a CA right lung admitted to the palliative ward with complaints of severe dyslexia. Right arm is lymphadenitis. There is facial puffiness, frown and fatigue look on her face. So she is clinically appearing dyslexic post chemotherapy and she is declared unfit for radiation therapy. So her saturations on room air are 92%. So this patient is having more symptom burden. So uh, high dose steroid and probably uh, advising home-based management because she is declared already unfit for radiation therapy as she has already received radiation. And uh, this patient who is an 18-year-old girl presented to casualty acute respiratory distress, more amount of upper extremity edema, facial puffiness, directed veins of the anterior chest wall, and uh, post-chemo, post-radiation. She is already underwent post-chemo, post-radiation, and her saturations and room air are 74%, which indicates that she is having severe respiratory distress. So, uh, high-dose steroids and oxygen support are indicated. Note that... Uh, you usually do not consider stenting in the patients who are having a bad prognosis. So we have uh, advised stenting over here, uh, who's, uh, who is clinically yet stable. So these are the references uh, which I have taken, uh, which are considered for the management, for the <coughs> uh, making of this power point. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, Praneet, it was such a wonderful presentation, Praneet. It was too good. You have you. included everything in your presentation. Uh, there is a question from Dr. Rajesh mm -hmm. Mahajan uh, Praneet uh, from Gangaram Hospital, no, from Jammu Medical College. Role of sputum cytology in investigation. Sometimes uh, uh, the medical oncologist uh, uh, can consider um, if there is underlying benign uh, obstruction also. Um, sometimes TB is uh, a common cause uh, which mimics um, uh, lung cancer. So, so sputum cytology can be useful uh, there um, uh, to rule out the uh, underlying TB. Some, uh, because many of many a times we see the patient, uh, uh, they present to us with the late stage of lung cancer, they initially managed in peripheral centers as a tuberculosis. And sometimes uh, uh, there can be some tumor cells which can also be identified in the sputum cytology. I'm not a very expert in this field, but... Rajesh, if Rajesh wants to say something about this, he has asked this question, what, what was there in his mind? Rajesh? Ma'am, uh, it was in the one of the slides that he had mentioned that sputum cytology should be done. That's why I asked it. No, okay. Actually, so it probably... that, uh, case to case basis can be considered. It doesn't mean that uh, it has to be done, but uh, we can consider uh, okay. on case to case basis. To probably to rule out uh, tuberculosis only. I think let 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 today we will confirm it again. Uh, Dr. Jennifer, would you like to add something in this uh, on this topic? I can't see any other questions. Yes, so this sputum cytology, meaning SVC obstruction, uh, sometimes it, uh, poses the challenge for a diagnosis. So that way, if we are really stuck, uh, sputum cytology is an option, but we should realize that in lung cancer itself, the sputum cytology sensitivity is 
only 60% and our yield may not be much. So when we are really stuck and patient is not uh, sick enough to have a bronchoscopy or any other diagnostic investigations, uh, we can consider, but probably not the first thing because uh, you will not get uh, histo proper histopathology to tell you whether it's lymphoma or lung cancer. Be much difficult with the with just a cytology alone. So sputum cytology is called the poor man's bronchoscopy. But uh, to keep in mind is uh, the poor yield and uh, the uh, low sensitivity. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the informative lecture. Any other comments from on this topic, uh, Dr. Jennifer? Um, yeah, so I, yeah, SVC obstruction is an oncological medical emergency and as palliative care physicians, it is very important because many of them are present with quite advanced disease. Uh, I think the few take home messages are uh, the challenge in diagnosis. So we should, we should, they all, we always say it is not that much an emergency that you go ahead and treat without obtaining a histopathology. Every effort should be taken to obtain uh, some form of uh, uh, biopsy, uh, uh, understanding of what exactly is the uh, pathology. So uh, I would again come back to saying a good general examination is very, very important. Sometimes we rely so much on uh, imaging that we may miss a, a lymph node or something which we can pick up on general examination. Second thing, um, when the patient is affordable and it's not a chemosensitive malignancy, uh, stenting is something that should be considered if there is expertise available and a cost is not an issue because uh, that really provides the best uh, symptom benefit in terms of uh, uh, quick reversal of symptoms. So the patient is much more comfortable to go ahead with other any form of oncological treatment. Um, otherwise, I think it uh, you've really you've covered uh, many aspects, and uh, also there are different uh, radiotherapy regimens which are available. And if the prognosis is good, uh, a higher dose should be considered than than in a palliative uh, setting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor Jennifer. I think uh, you have pointed out very important aspect and very important points. Uh, this is uh, this is important that I, I also uh, acknowledge this, that whenever stunting is possible, uh, we should do it because this is the only thing which will give you, uh, give the patient maximum benefit. So stunting, whenever possible, we should definitely try to give this possibility of giving. Uh, there is one... Uh, Question for Pranit, uh, whether, what is the role of diuretics again from Dr. Rajesh? Uh, I want his personal experience in this. How much, how much dose he's using? Uh, okay, personal using. experience. Yeah. So, sir, uh, we'll be using with a lower dose, never come to the level of uh, 40 mg. Uh, we have used only 20 mg uh, uh, twice or thrice in a day and to see uh, whether the patient is having clinically a relief in the airway uh, uh, airway symptoms, that is shortness of breath. So what we have observed is uh, when we are using when these patients present with uh, superior vena cava obstruction, we have managed uh, you know, three to four cases, and they ultimately ended up in terminal sedation because of the uh, refractory uh, shortness of breath. So using a diuretic hasn't yielded much of benefit for us, but um, theoretically we can give it a try. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, they, I can't see any more questions. Just let me see. Now, Prani, there are so many compliments for your lecture. Thank you. Dr. Kalpana wanted to add. Uh, I think Dr. Kalpana says that uh, the patient often comes for EBUS for diagnosis. I think EBUS has a role uh, in diagnosing many a times. Dr. Kalpana, you want to open your mic and say something? Uh, yes, madam. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, yeah, I feel that a lot of these patients do come for EBUS and uh, we are able to, you know, get a tissue diagnosis because even if the patient is very breathless, they sometimes do the EBUS with local under 
you know, with the patient sitting also. So this is one way of getting the cytology uh, the, uh, in difficult circumstances. Uh, that's all I wanted to add. Right. This uh, yes. Good morning. Good morning, ma'am. Can I add? This is Vilha yeah, from Hyderabad. Yeah. yeah. Uh, first of all, I want to congratulate uh, Praneet for excellent presentation. And as ma'am, uh, you rightly said, uh, we are really very proud of the work uh, that Praneet and his team has been doing in palliative care setting up and also improving the uh, education for uh, the postgraduates now who have registered. I just wanted to add uh, a small uh, experience that I have with these patients, some of them who have presented upfront and they require um, a central venous axis for starting chemotherapy. So we all know that uh, axis on the upper uh, part of the body is not possible. And uh, we have done femoral uh, picks for uh, a couple of these patients. And uh, yeah, we've also published them. So I just wanted to um, put this perspective that sometimes we might have to consider um, central venous axis and that has to be on the leg for treating these patients. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thanks a lot. Thank you. So, uh, Can I, I can't see. Ah, Dr. Dr. Stanley, please go ahead. Go ahead. Just a question. Thank you, Praneet, for a very nice overview. Thank uh, you. Just a question. Did you come across any mention of uh, for, you know, in the context of benign SVC obstruction, uh, the use, especially at home management, the use of any subcut heparin? Subcutaneous heparin in benign SVC, oh, sir. I haven't uh, actually, uh, I actually searched for home management of superior vinegar obstruction uh, patients. There are no published articles as such, but uh, uh, in the benign SVCO, there is an uh, there is a benefit with uh, uh, anticoagulation. Yeah. Uh, definitely, there is some benefit with anticoagulation benign causes. So, can be considered, sir. Um, Thank you. Thank you, sir. So good, Pranit. Thank you very much. Uh, Pranit has uh, such a wonderful presentation. Thank you and uh, Thank you. excellent decision that uh, if residents there is a problem we can speak and you have given such a wonderful overview of superior vena cava obstruction. I think all the residents those who have joined must be uh, must be very thrilled. And uh, all these presentations are available on the IEPC website. And uh, again, I will uh, I have decided that every week on Monday I will request everyone. Those who have not been regi uh, been registered for the conference, please register for Bangalore conference. Those who have not become IAPC member, please become IAPC member. There are lots and lots of advantage of becoming IAPC member. All these people, those who are joining, 57 people I can see. And if I minus myself and Arjuna, two, and Nisha, three. If you are not IAPC member, please become IAPC member and register for the conference. Madam, one minute, ma'am. One minute. Yeah. Actually, uh, uh, last time there was a link which was common for uh, membership of IAPC along with the uh, conference registration. This time the payment pathways are, uh, payment gateways are separate. That is for the IAPC registration, it is separate. And uh, registration of the conference, it is separate. So if we request a stall which is placed in the conference, whoever who will be coming to the conference, they can take the IAPC membership on the spot itself. We are going to have a stall and we are going to uh, ask everyone to become IAPC member. This is our, this is our uh, already. Thank you, Pranita. I think we have already decided that we request everyone to because there are a lot of advantages. We don't. We are yes. not asking for IAPC. We are asking for themselves that they should become member and get the advantage what IAPC is giving them. So it is their benefit, and we will request everyone to become IAPC member. Thank you, thank you Pranit, and thank you everyone for joining early morning. It's very cold in north of India, but still people I have joined in time. Uh, thank you. And we will see you next week, uh, Monday morning, okay, before 6.30. Thank, thank you. you very